<laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Dave. Um, I am a, a director of photography. I'm an animator, I'm an editor. I work for a company called PWP Video in Germantown. Uh, we do all stuff like this. We do, we do uh, short narratives, we do uh, corporate stuff, we do um, all kinds of graphics for all those projects too. So I'm um, trying to make a presentation for you guys of the stuff I've learned over the past 20 plus years. Um, so like I said in the description, this won't be so much, you know, how to do stuff because you guys have all progr different programs that, that, that can accomplish these things. This is more about the, uh, the why and the, uh, the, like the philosophy of like using digital effects to good effect. Um, mostly just because, just because you can use digital effects, you probably should. But um, all right, let's get started. Let me share a screen. 42 people. Come on in, everybody. All right. So full disclosure. Let's see if I can get this a little bigger again. I'd like to try at least try and see the audience. There we go. All right. OK. So uh, you guys can see my screen OK? Screen, screen share good? Good. All right. Yes. All righty. All right. So full disclosure, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, yes, that is me. 20 years ago, I had a lot more hair. The hair is not a visual effect, as you may or may not have guessed. We do video effects because they're fun. They're exciting, right? You want to be proud of your work. You want to show off. You want to be super fancy. And then you do stuff like this. So does everyone want to make a lightsaber fight? No. Should you? Of course, you don't have to, but there's all those flashy effects, there's special effects, there's like, you know, all this stuff you can do uh, for a big, bold look. But sometimes you have to rein in a little bit and you more subtlety, right? Uh, sometimes the best effects are the ones you don't even see. Um, uh, to this day, I still watch Jurassic Park and I'm still blown away, but like sometimes I can't tell what's a rubber puppet and what's a CG thing. That's the kind of effect you want, seamless. Or you can go for big and bold. There's no, there's no rule that you can't do this. Um, so again, we're, talk, we're gonna talk more about the, uh, not gonna talk less about how to do this type of stuff and why. If you have questions about how to do things, I'm more than happy to answer them as best I can. But again, we all use different programs. So it's difficult for me to like say, well, After Effects does this, but like this other program does this, um, do my best. Um, when you do video effects, the thing you're looking for is you're selling a feeling, right? You want to sell, you want to sell uh, uh, an effect or uh, an emotion. And all right now I'm going to show you Casablanca. Who's seen Casablanca? Just shake your heads. Excellent movie. Directed by Michael Curtiz, 1942. You got Humphrey Bogart, Peter Lorre. This is a fantastic scene. Um, so this is the part where I would say uh, let's have an open discussion. So uh, to invoke invoking feelings of this film, what tells us that this movie is old? You can feel free to just unmute and just shout something out. Uh, it's black and white or gray it's black skin. and white, right? We, old movies are black and white. What else? The aspect ratio. Aspect ratio. It's four three. This is a very old aspect ratio. On your screens probably right now, you're looking at a 16 by nine screen. This was shot in 4.3, old school film. So you got this thing called pillar boxing, which you got the black lines on, on, the, on, the, on both sides of the screen. What else? Um, she, they are also uh, within the attire is very old. It's like Art a direct. very old tuxedo. There and you go. Also it's smoking inside, which today you can't even do. Smoking. Smoking. It's one of those things where like even I didn't catch it because I grew up in an era of people smoking. People don't smoke in public places anymore, at least in restaurants. So the smoking, the uh, the tuxedos, you know, Humphrey Burger has this awesome like sash like jacket that you don't see anymore. It's a very classic look, very back of the, of the 40s, excuse me, of the 1940s. Um, the art direction, like look at these great shadows in the background with the lanterns and like this whole like uh, uh, post Edwardian kind of like motif. You got the, uh, the light and shadow, the hard light. That's look at the shadow on Peter Lorre's shadow, a uh, shoulder. So um, also one other thing is the film grain, like it has a graininess on the film grain. Yes. 
But yeah, old, old movies, sometimes because of the, their literal age of the actual celluloid, were grainy. Um, also, uh, film stocks weren't as sophisticated back then. Um, that is not to say that uh, uh, film grain is not seen anymore. There's plenty of beautiful films these days who use film grain to evoke any kind of like textual emotion, uh, atmosphere, things like that. Okay. So I, I, we raise all these great points. There's no special effects in this, in this scene, but we got all these elements. We, we know it's old because of certain things in the, in the shot, okay? And my point is that Casablanca does not look like this, okay? It does, does not sepia toned. It doesn't have film scratches, okay? This actually came from a very beautiful Blu-ray, a re-edition re, re of, uh, of Casablanca. Casablanca is in, is in fantastic shape. There was no need to add any kind of special crazy effects to make it look old. We already knew it was old. So using that, um, you're given all these, we can, you're given all these visual clues as to that we've been immersed in for decades, the smoking, the, the clothing. We didn't have to get any, any special effects. That's more my point. Okay. That makes sense? My point made? Don't have to, don't have to overdo it. You can do it with art direction, you can do it with direction, you can do it with all kinds of stuff. Okay, so, pop quiz. Um, find the effect. Would it be an in-camera effect, a digital effect? We're gonna look, look at a film called Omelie, one of my personal favorites uh, from 2001. Hey, excuse me. Uh, directed by Jean-Pierre Junet. You should look at the films, they're pretty fantastic. Audrey Toto was her actor. So here we go. So find the effect. Or effects, it can be more than one. All right, what'd you say? Shout it out. Um, time lapse or like very fast speed, time lapse or uh, uh, hyper lapse, the time lapse, yeah, hyper uh, just to get the feeling of like she spent a lot of time cutting these things apart. We don't want to see, we don't see eight hours of her cutting things apart. So, for comedic effect, we speed things up. Uh, what else? Nobody said zoom. Ah, uh, the zoom. Well, the zoom is actually that's a real camera effect. The camera the camera's on a dolly getting pushed forward. But it, so so keep that in mind. In camera effects are also legitimate too. There's one more major one too. You can the shout it out. Lampshade. The blue lampshade. Art direction. So the the color palette on this movie is very green, orange, and blue. In almost every scene, Jean Pierre puts a big pop of blue in all of his his frames. Um, now in post, you can. That you know that lampshade could have been green. In post, you could change it to blue, so you can do all kinds of uh, uh, chroma key or power window effects to change colors. Oh. So one, once you shoot something, you don't have to. You're not necessarily stuck with it. There's one more. Who was who, who had a, a thought? So that was color correction, right? That you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking color correction. You can you can do color correct to the extreme. This movie was color corrected to the extreme. They got as much uh, art direction like the throw pillows or and like the I don't know if it's just me, but I think we might have lost you. Uh, yeah, Dave, we can't hear you. Yeah, hold on. Oh, Zoom. Okay. I think we can hear you now. Nope. Oh, yes. I Okay. There you go. It's the internet connection. Isn't technology grand? <laughs> All right, let's let's go back into it. Clock ticking. All right, we're talking we're talking about color correction. And uh, you got me back. You got me okay? Not good. Not Fantastic. Okay. All right. So art direction, color correction, all these things were effects 
in both in camera and digitally. Let's see. Okay, find the effect on this one. You can shout it out. I'll give you a hint. It's not the guy standing in the, it's not the guy in the superhero outfit. He's real. That was an actor dressed in a superhero outfit. It was a weird gig. So up here, the uh, the sign was was uh, put in back put in post. We weren't able to use the uh, the sign on the, on the existing uh, storefront, so we replaced it with this sign up here. We, all this stuff, all this trim was put in in post. This is all fake. You guys can see uh, my mouse, right? Oh, I thought it was the thing on the side that kind of looks like it's like a pinhole camera. Oh, this thing over here? No, like you can see close to the edge is kind of like blue and red and you can see on like the ah. edges of some objects. That's what I thought it was. Okay. No, that's actually, that is my polarizer. Uh, the shot is so wide, uh, the camera is actually seeing the inside of my filter. The camera was that wide. Whoops. Thanks, PowerPoint. But this is done for practical reasons. We weren't able, we wanted to have a specific name of this store, so we replaced it. Subtle, not exciting, but it told our story better because we were actually able to art direct what Salon Celeste looked like because our superhero needed a haircut. It's a long story, I won't go into it. Okay. Okay. This is a music video I shot a while ago. Can you guys hear the music at all? I think it's just playing for me. Okay, good. It's deafening. I'll do my best. So somewhere in this in this sequence. Oh wait a minute. Oh, here we go. Somewhere in the sequence is an actual video effect I had to pull off. And there's color correction involved. There's some there's some moody blues and there's some Nice bright colors here. Um, you can see it's not repeating. You dirty rat. There we go. I'll start late one more time. I'll give you hints. One of the it's one of the dancers. Anybody see it? It's subtle, but it was necessary. So in this scene, we have our, our actress. She's sitting here and the dancers are dancing happily around her while she's sitting in the languages. But there's the problem with the scene. I need, for the, for the edit to work right, I needed her to be sitting in the chair. In reality, she was standing. So I had to actually go in and replace her with a previous take. And since my camera didn't move, I was able to replace her and leave everyone else in place. There's some giveaways, like you can see the shadow down here of her legs in the chair, but it's subtle enough that it helped my edit. I, need, I needed her mopey in the chair, but it, it just didn't work. But the, the, the dancer performance was spot on, but she stood up at the last minute. It's dance. It's, you know, dance is one of those like organic things you really can't control sometimes. And that's cool. Um, and sometimes you'll find some great moments where, uh, like that. But, you know, I'll play it again real quick. But you see the points I'm making? It's not about the whole like splash and huge thing bombastic circumstance. Sometimes subtlety is what you want to do. There, you can see your shadow right there. Dance is a little bit different than the rest of them. So somebody asked Dave, so the girl, so the girl is on a split screen put in the middle. Essentially, yeah. Uh, what we call it in, in, in uh, effects, effects lingo, it's called a power window or a mask. So I was able to like draw a mask around her and punch out everybody else and replace her with a different take. Um, split screen is, is, is similar to that. Um, again, that's why I didn't want to go in, into the how to do this stuff, like, because all different, there's a hundred different ways to do this, accomplish the same kind of effects. You can use, you can use the, um, uh, the barn wipe effect to kind of like help cut things out. Um, the masking is, an, is a great tool to use. Um, 
but here's where actually I use it to replace a, a, a performance. Uh, let's see where we're going now. Oh, any questions? Concerns? Event? Anything in the chat? Uh, I can't see chat. Nope, right no, okay. I, not, nothing's in the chat. That was the okay. only question. All right. So if you want to ask a question and you're, you want to type it in the chat, I'd be happy to pass it on to Dave, or you can unmute yourself and ask the question yourself. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Once again, pop quiz, we're going to find the effect. This is the movie Star Trek by J.J. Abrams, 2009, starring Chris Pine, Zarka Quinto, and Simon Pegg. Find the effect. Play a little scene here. Or effects. You shout them out. So somebody's saying the background and light, the glares, lens flare, white light. Pretty much, that's pretty much it. It's the, the lens flares. Now they catch with the lens flares. Like J.J. Abrams, you know, he went through a whole big lens flare phase. With all his all his movies had to have lens flare, and all his TV shows had, uh, following had to have lens flares and stuff like that. So these are actually all in-camera effects. Some of them were put in post, but for the most part, um, the lenses they were using, they would take just big deer spotter lights and flash them right into the lens, and you get the lens flare effect, which... You know, some people say, oh, lens flares are bad. Well, sometimes lens flares can look just pretty darn cool. And that's what they did in, in these scenes. Those are mostly all in, almost all in-camera effects. When there was a big, high, tense moment, he just, like, flashed the lens with a, with a, a flashlight. Um, you know, just like that. And coming from the edge. I'm doing this with, with a webcam. There's a nice little lens flare right there. And that's what we call in-camera effects. Now, granted, once you once you do those in camera effects in your camera, you're stuck with them. Um, but sometimes that's fine. Um, there's an old old film adage, you know. There's the there's the movie you write. There's three different movies you make. Three. That's a three. Three different movies you make. There's the movie you write. There's the movie you shoot. And the movie you edit. They're almost three completely different animals. You will find things when you're editing something that you didn't realize that you could have done when you were writing it or directing it or shooting it. Uh, but yes, uh, yes to all three. I think uh, a lot of the backgrounds were also digital effects as well. Um, there were some of the, like, the poppy lights were put in post. I think, uh, here, let's, let's play it back real quick. That's the wrong button. I push buttons for a living. There we go. So let's see. Uh, this is pretty much all in camera. There are these things right above. Chris Pine's head, that's, that's probably put in post. Although I wouldn't be surprised. Light does funny things with some of these lenses. Uh, this, is, this is an anamorphic lens, um, which is used a lot in, in cinema. Um, the anamorphic lens, if you put a light into that lens, it does all kinds of crazy, crazy uh, uh, visual effects. So Dave, you have a question. How do you approach starting your FX project? process? Do you edit first, then add effects, or complete the effects scene and then edit? Oh. Sometimes we'll have an idea where like, ooh, wouldn't it be cool if uh, the actor did this and there was an effect, you know, like a light beam effect or something like that, you know, we'll, we'll just do something real fantastical. You can plan for these things. And if you're doing any kind of like heavy effects work, planning is best. Plan as much as you can. Make a plan. Make two plans. Make a contingency plan. Always, when you're shooting video or film, just write it down, draw it down as, as best you can get it in a solid form. Um, sometimes, and this is the example I'll, I'll show you right now. Um, uh, sometimes uh, things hit me in afterwards. You know, there's there's a really dramatic shot that we have, but I want to make it just a little bit more dramatic. Um, so this actually will help answer that question. I hope. Uh, let me see here. All right, so this was a little piece we did. Uh, this is, uh, our, our subject was Kareem. And um, we'll let this shot play out real quick.
So a bunch went into this shot. Um, would you say uh, Kareem's having a good day right now? Is it a good day or a bad day? Anyone? The chat popped up. Somebody said bad, 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 bad. They think he's having a bad day. Kareem's having a bad day. This was, uh, we, were, we, were, uh, we were talking about uh, his past and how he, you know, he had a, one really bad day. Um, what evokes that? It's not very colorful, is it? It's blue, from desaturated. He's walking away. He's walking out of focus, right? He's walking out of our field of vision, literally and figuratively. Um, but I'll tell you, when we first shot it, it looked like this. This is what it looked like out of the camera. Bright and colorful. My doorbell just rang. They can wait. <laughs> um, it was a bright, sunshine, beautiful day outside. It was a great day for shooting. Um, so this is how it came out of the camera. Let's go back and uh, compare it real quick. So we added a little lens flare. We'll let, we uh, moves his head. Lens flare pops there. Helps blur him a little bit. Let's him walk away out more to focus. But this is what it looked like originally. Real quick, we'll play it back again. No lens flare. There's some lens flares there, but that was just an effect of the actual in-camera lens flares. And he walks away. So the first thing I did was do some color correction. I pulled all that saturation out, I added some blue. Typically, not always, but blue means sad. And yellow sunshiny means happy. These are all subjective terms, right? But for the most part, blue is gloomy, not having a good day. But that I just want to add a little more. This, I want, this is a big dramatic moment in, in Kareem's life, so I'm going to add a little bit more. So I added that lens flare. The important thing was I motivated that lens flare. We're going to hear that word again. So as you saw my lighting class, we're going to motivate something, or something needs to be motivated for it to really look good, and make sense. So I had no lights to poke into the camera or anything like that or there's, there's no actual light source but there's this big he walks off into this big bright street scene back there where the sun is shining we're in the shadow he's walking away so that's my motivated source that's that's the one place i could motivate where a lens flare or some kind of pop of light could happen and i added i added this and it's going to flash a couple times so once again I motivated it. Why is it flashing? Because Kareem's head is moving back and forth. I put, I, I put that flashing in time with Kareem covering, covering that big light source back there. Uh, Dave, somebody wanted to know um, the, when he goes, when the camera goes out of focus, when he walks away, was that an mm -hmm. in-camera edit or did you digitally do that effect? That was in-camera. Um, that's all on camera. So um, if you guys have covered, talked about depth of field yet, uh, when your iris is way wide open, your depth of field is very shallow, right? So not uh, so like Kareem's in focus, our subject's in focus, we create that separation. Our attention is on Kareem, right? The background, not so much, it's out of focus. So the camera is set for a, a very wide aperture, which means there's a very thin plane of focus that's gonna happen. It's called deep focus, where everything's in focus. And there's shallow focus, where that, that focus is real tight. So this is in camera. So when he, oops, hitting the wrong arrows. There we go. So when, when uh, Kareem walks away, he's going to walk out of focus. I'm not going to follow him with the focus. My focus is set for where he was standing. As he gets further and further away, he gets more and more out of focus. That was all in camera. That, that's an in-camera effect. Somebody also asked, Dave, what's the hardest thing to add effects to, in your opinion? Mm. Uh, it's hard. Let's, uh, let's look at this. Let's look at this shot again. If if this shot was all in focus, this is a lot of work to make it look like it's out of focus. You would have to draw a mask all the way around Kareem, around his ear, around his neck, down his shoulder, right, and then then he walks away. So now I got to animate that mask. To follow him. Look, he wobbles back and forth, takes a step back. I would have to mimic his movements 
frame by frame. It, I've done it. It's agonizing. And it's, it takes hours and hours and hours. Um, it's the hardest to fake things. It's hard to fake in-camera effects because those things are so organic and so natural. Um, that's the hardest thing to do is to fake focus effects and fake uh, camera light effects. They're very, very difficult. Um, but here, so I added this, this little uh, lens flare. And here it is with the lens flare. Boink. Real subtle. But it kind of tells us maybe there's like a reflective light back there or some kind of like window or something, some kind of shiny object back there. And you really can't even see the rest of the lens flare over here. It's very, very, very subtle. You may be less subtle on the, on the zoom. But again, I'm not trying to beat everyone over the head. So the next thing I added was a little bit of a, just a little bit of a lens, a lens pop. Because sometimes when those lights, when that, when that light source goes right into the camera lens, see all this like, this milkiness out here. It's just an effect of the light bouncing around inside those lens elements. So I'm gonna try and mimic that a little bit. So again, this light is, is, is uh, pulsing. I'm motivating it because cream's moving in, in and out of that light source. So here it is with the lens flare and that little pop. So there's that milkiness, but he blocks the light. Now he doesn't block the light and he walks away. And now he's even more distant from us. You can't see him very well. So here it is all together. And then I think I added, um, wait, no. Yeah, that's it all together. I had a little bit of a, of a vignette on the sides here, a little bit of like darkening on the edges, just for a little bit more dramatic effect. All right. Now questions. Anything you've seen so far that didn't make sense or any, any other uh, thoughts? Questions that you guys are working on? So, so problems that you want to try and solve? Uh, somebody posted a question to you. What um, made you go into this as a career? <laughs> um, my my cheap my cheap punk out answer is uh, Star Wars. <laughs> uh, yeah, saw the original episode four. I was three years old in the theater, blew me away. Um, and then learning about how to make those movies, um, and then afterwards going to uh, college for film. Uh, one of the, the big moments was when I first learned three-point lighting. When I first learned you can move lights around, um, it just twisted my mind in a way that like, wait, I can manipulate how light plays in a room. It doesn't have to let like a window dictate what, 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 what light is happening. Um, and just, the, it's just, um, I sometimes have trouble calling this career an art form. It's, I, I consider it more a craft because a uh, craft a, a, a craft is something that requires technical and artistic knowledge uh, to bring together. You don't need all technical knowledge. You need a whole lot of artistic knowledge, but any variation of those two um, is what uh, is what filmmaking is all about. And I love, you know, um, I love messing with, you know, cameras and lights and and doing funky things like this. You know, it just uh, it just makes me happy. Um, but that's that's what motivated me to do, doing this is to uh, just telling stories as in dramatic form as possible. Uh, somebody asked about um, what software is the best to use. Hmm. There's no best software. Um, again, that's why I made this, I designed this whole thing around um, um, the, the whys, less than, uh, less than the hows. Uh, I use After Effects. Um, it is an incredibly complicated, uh, wonderful, powerful tool. You can do almost anything in After Effects. Um, I, quite frankly, I'm, I'm stuck with that answer because that's what all I ever use. I've been using After Effects for over 20 years. So that, that's an amazing tool to use. Um, I know there's other ones out there that can accomplish just as many things. So it's, it's really, there's only really no one best software to use. I think I saw something else come through. Okay. 
Okay. So here's another, another uh, where we'll talk a little bit about green screen now, about a green screen and compositing. Um, so here's a shot we did uh, for, <laughs> it, it is a Zoom, about a Zoom uh, call, but this is way pre-COVID, this is about three years ago. This is for an online teaching course. And they used Zoom or this thing called Zoom. Uh, we didn't know what Zoom was, um, but here was the final product. This is a whole introduction to the, the, the beginning of the, beginning of the piece. So all of these actors are on green screens. Uh, we did all these interviews um, on the same day. We interviewed about 15 people in one day, put them all in front of a green screen. And um, so every single one of these interviews is on a green screen. We all composited them into a Zoom interface and then composited them onto uh, this laptop shot. So this, this, this whole thing that never even happened on this laptop. Uh, it starts with uh, our subject, Amy. She's, a, she's the last person we see in the whole thing. And this is the, this is the green screen shot. Um, so with green screen, we'll talk a little, bit about, a little bit about green screen. Green screen is challenging because um, we'll get into it in a second. But the most difficult thing about green screen is uh, what makes a bad green screen is when the background doesn't match what the lighting is doing. It's always challenging because when, the, when my client says, I want to do a green screen thing, my first thing I say is, why do I have to? And the second thing I ask is, what do you want to put behind them? Because I need to light the person to make it look like they're in that environment. I want to motivate the, that light, right? If, 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 the, if we look at Amy here and we put a, a, a room behind her and the windows on this side, I better be lighting her from this side to motivate where that light is coming from. If I light it from this side, it's not gonna make any sense. It looks strange. So we start with this, and then we actually do the little chroma key, pop the green out as best we can. Now I still have part of that, that green screen is in the bottom corners, but again, with uh, masking tools, we can cut those parts out. So cut those little corners there. So now she's in this room, but what's wrong with this shot? What's not motivated? I think a chat popped up. Lighting. Light. The light's not motivated. The window's on the wrong side. Because we, we shot the green screen and we had to get, you know, we shot 15 interviews. We had to find 15 backgrounds. I was, this is a photograph of a friend of mine's living room. We were running around like, you know, just uh, snapping pictures of office spaces, snapping pictures of whatever we could find. So the first thing we'll do is switch it. Does that make more sense? That light is coming from the right side of the screen, hitting the right side of her face. Help sell that, help sell that, that effect a little bit more. So remember we were talking before about depth of field, deep focus versus shallow focus. Something else that will help sell us on this to make it look like more real. Everything's in focus. Amy's in focus. That painting is in focus. The couch is in focus. I can almost see outside the window. That's in focus. The next thing we'll do is give it a little bit of a blur. A little bit of a little bit of a blur is one of the most powerful tools I have as a filmmaker. Sometimes, a little bit of a blur can help sell almost any effect. Um, but now it looks a little bit more like this is an actual camera with a person in a room. Here's the laptop. The laptop just had a green screen on it. Just took a um, uh, did a uh, shot of a of a of a laptop. Oh, sorry, I didn't shoot this. I'm sorry. I apologize. This is a um, this is from um, like Pond Five or something. We purchased a shot. This is a uh, stock footage. So you can find all kinds of fun stuff like this out there on uh, on stock footage websites. But here's a shot of just literally a uh, the laptop is turned on and has just a a, a green uh, just a green image on it. So it's the actual like luminescent quality of, of the screen. And the one thing, look at the keyboard on the screen. You got that horrible green reflection off the keys. 
so that anytime you see, um, anytime your actor or your subject is too close to the green, so we, we managed to keep that, that green a good, at least six feet away from her. Because if you're too close to that green, that green's gonna splash back on the edges of your, of your subject. And getting rid of that is a nightmare. Because you get that green edge, or sometimes like you'll see green on their faces. And you can't, it's, it's very hard to get rid of that. There's some tools out there that can do it. Um, but that's one of the big challenges. So we got this green reflection off the keyboards, or off the keys, excuse me. So we take Amy's shot, we take Roy's shot, we take Alice's shot, we take all these shots, we've composited them, and then we create this. So this was done in After Effects. So what I did was I composited all of them together into a zoom interface, and I had to mimic that slow twist around the laptop. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, I, I have like a, a mirror reflection of what's going on on the screen, because that's what would happen in real life. I'm motivating that reflection off the, off the, off the uh, keys with what's on the screen. So we put them all put them together and we're back to this. I couldn't get rid of all that green, but if you look at the keyboard this time, the keyboard mimics what's happening on the screen, like a real laptop would. So little details like that. I don't know if you can see it in the zoom. Again, I don't know how good the broadcast is, but uh, it's little details like that that'll help sell your effects. Dave, somebody asked, did you have to track camera track the shot and replace the green screen with the footage? Yes. Yeah. So that, that is a tool in After Effects. You can uh, you can track motion. Uh, you basically just take whatever it is, like your flat your flat effect, and you can kind of pin corner it to create the. Um, I don't know why they're not repeating. There we go. Um, to create the uh, the parallax effect, the perspective. Oh, I also did add this. this you know, I'm just I, I like I like messing with this stuff. This that sun reflection. Watch it pop out the right side of the screen. I added a little bit, little bit of a little bloom when it comes out. That wasn't in the original shot either. That was just you know me putting my fingerprint on something. There's that little pop of light that's going to happen. And about there, bloom. A little, a little bloom right there. That yellow smudge you see. Again, things that would happen if you did poke light into a lens. That's what happens. It's those, those little. It's it's mimicking those natural effects. It really helps sell a, uh, any kind of visual effect. Dave, somebody also asked, how did you overlay the Zoom buttons with the people talking? Oops. Oh, I see. Oh, OK. Um, that was also done in After Effects. So uh, we did, did a screen record of an actual Zoom call to just kind of like uh, steal all those little like icons and stuff like that. And then um, in After Effects or whatever other like special effects, even Premiere, some edit software can do this too. Or you can just kind of put things in, uh, in different, different places. And then what's called nesting, if you've gotten into nesting, Premiere and some other video edit software, you can actually, let's say you edit, uh, you, you, let's say you put this into a timeline and you edited this. You can then take that timeline and drop it into another timeline and then do effects even on top of that. It's called nesting. It's uh, an incredibly powerful tool. That's pretty much how we got that composited all together. Any other question popped up? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, can you explain why nesting is helpful? Uh, nesting is great. So, um, Let's count the number of, of uh, composite effects on this shot here. So you've got the whole, like the black background. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. If you count this whole reflection down here, there are 11 elements. There's maybe one or two more, 11 elements. Um, wait, does my, my sun pop out here? There it is, there's my sun pop, this like video. There's 12, 12 elements. When you're dealing with, and it's also moving, it has this, like this, uh, you know, this parallax motion going on. Um, nesting, I can create this flat, this flat edit. 
I create this flat edit. So all those, those 12, the 15 elements are in one timeline. If I nest it, it then turns into just one effect that I then just drop somewhere else. So any kind of effects I do, I don't have to affect 12 things. I can affect just the one thing that contains all the other things. Nesting is a great tool. Uh, look into it. Um, it's pretty powerful. I think somebody, the follow-up question to that is, does this process take a long time or is it a shorter amount of time to nest? Well, nesting is easy. It's a right click. Uh, but it, so it takes long is building uh, what you want to nest. Um, this, probably, you know, this, this whole shot probably represents a good, I'll say, you know, 10 hours of work. Um, see, do I ever go? Yeah, I mean, I think this represents a good 10, probably 12 hours of work altogether. Uh, that does not include, you know, the full day of getting the 12 interviews of all the people we see on the screen um, and all the in my green screen, all those people, and then going out and shooting all like, I mean, talking days of work now um, to get all the photo, at least all the photographs you see, but all the backgrounds are all actual photographs of places that we you know, went to to get, to get shot. Um, so it can take a very long time. Uh, so patience, Patience is important uh, with, with video effects like this to get it right. Um, um, you know, I know so time is also, and trust me, time is also an issue. Uh, time, you know, we have time for to accomplish all of our uh, assignments out in, the, out in, in, in my world, it's uh, due dates. You know, I, I, have, uh, I have due dates for my clients that you know, need this stuff. So um, more time, the better. And uh, the more you get to tweak it and also, um, there's a, a lovely adage that, uh, that I've learned is that the, uh, the morning is wiser than the evening. When you're sitting there and you're just like pounding your head against the screen and getting the effect right, put it away, save it, take a walk, um, go watch TV, get a snack, come back the next day. Uh, you'll see things like, oh, what was I thinking? Like, this, this looks terrible. Let me, let, me, let me try something else. Um, the important part of this experience too is that when you're, and I wish I would have said this in my lighting class too, or actually all elements of film, writing, directing, um, anything like that, is um, when you're out there, we're all consumers of media, right? We're all watching TV, we're watching Hulu, we're watching our Netflix, we're watching our Amazon. Be active when you watch this stuff. Pay attention to like, well, that actor did a great job in that moment. What made it great? What was that, what was that actor doing? Oh, that light, that light effect was fantastic. Think about it. Where was that light coming from? What kind of, where was it hitting the back of their head? Was it like a big soft source? And why was it fantastic? Why did it, why did it, why was it so great in that, in that moment? So really um, just take mental notes. Don't, don't be a passive when you, when you watch all this stuff and enjoy all the movies, enjoy all the, the fantastic amounts of TV out there. The doorbell rang again. Somebody really wants me. Um, too bad. You guys are more important. Um, uh, just take notes. Um, and you, you will learn about all uh, because we are in a fantastic golden age of fantastically beautifully, beautifully crafted movies and TV. Not all great, um, but a lot of it's fantastic. Um, see how it's shot. Yeah, and learn about it. Do some Google searches. Like how how was that shot made? Nine times out of ten, there's a blog post out there of like how it was shot, what camera was used, and what lights were used. Um, uh, anything like that. Uh, I think we got four or five minutes left. There's a couple questions that came in that we didn't answer. Like, uh, what would be a good starting point for getting into learning effects? Oh, um, just digging in. Uh, the, you know, getting a hold of some some piece of software and just start just start playing with it. Um, you can learn more about like. Uh, you know, there's all, you know, just like there's YouTube University. There's all kinds of stuff you can. Um, you can learn these days, listen to your teachers. Um, that's a good one too. Um, but just getting in and playing with it, you know, like, ooh, I want to try like a, a crazy color effect. Let's just do it. Grab some, grab some freeware software. There's, there's software out there or software you have available to you any, any, any way. Uh, shoot a, a photograph. It doesn't have to be video or shoot some video on your phone and just get it off your phone, get it into some software. And um, that person is going to get a piece of my mind. Um, not really. Um, yeah, just, just get into it and just try it out. Try things, experiment. 
Uh, okay, somebody else asked, what are your thoughts on live action adaptations of animated shows or films? Some of them are really good and some of them are really bad. Um, <laughs> it, they're a lot of subjective too, um, but um, I'm trying to think of any kind of uh, adaptations are going on that, um, I mean, the Marvel movies are, are very well done. Um, and a lot of that is, um, you know, directorial and story choices. So, um, and they're all shot wonderfully too. Um, I know, um, I mean, I'll geek out for a second, you know, watching Mandalorian and there's some characters that there were, there were some characters that showed up that were animated before. And these were cartoon characters that were brought into a live action series and like, it's costuming, it's acting, it's um, it's how it's how you know how much uh, how much uh, care you put into translating those things that really uh, that makes a difference. Uh, somebody else asked, "What genre is the most challenging to do effects with?" Oh, um, I would say period pieces, uh, historical, even contemporary. You know, stuff contemporary. Everyone, you know. The, the sci-fi stuff is easy. You just make some laser beams and make some pew pew sounds and that's, you know, you're done for the day. Uh, it's what the most challenging is when you're doing stuff like, um, you know, the stuff we were talking about before. Let me scroll back here. I hear, you know, I, I'm mimicking a real life camera effect. That's pretty challenging. Um, you know, mimicking real life is probably the hardest thing to do. Real, like natural kind of things because we, we experience real life with our own eyes every single day. You're trying to fake, you're trying to find a fake out a living human who has seen this stuff in real life. And if it doesn't look right, eh. so you got like uh, period pieces are really good. Like, you know, we look at like, you know, uh, 1930s uh, shows about like 1930s, you know, pre-war stuff, you know, like, and they have to create like the big marquees and things like that. And like the old tiny cars driving past, like those, those can be effect shots sometimes. And they can, uh, they can make or break and make or break your, your piece. How do you avoid avoid effects being dated? Hmm. Um, dated. I guess effects done badly. Um, you know, it, if you look, go back and look at you know old '80s movies, '80s action movies, or '80s uh, sci-fi or adventure movies. Um, th there's like they don't hold up. You know, because they were they were they were presented to us in lower resolution, and when they get to higher resolution, you look at that old movie and you go, "Oh, wow, that dragon looks terrible. Or that that airplane flying or that jet fighter looks awful." Because you can see like you know all the lines and the edges around things. Um, uh, that can also be charming too. You could you know you could make it look that way on purpose. That, that could be a, a art direction decision. Um, but data is old and badly done. Any more questions out there from anybody that I missed? Well, I hope this helps, guys, everybody. Hope, uh, hope it was uh, educational, edutainment. Well, good luck in all your projects. I'm looking forward to seeing stuff in April. Did a request? Did a question pop up or? Uh, no. Okay. We're all good. All right. Well, thank you um, so much, Dave. You're welcome. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Good to see everybody. Yeah. Good luck in your projects. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you.